Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cornelly. I think we can we can start, right? Um, okay, welcome. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are located. Uh, welcome to this uh, virtual event uh, on capacity building perspective on, on capacity building in science, technology, innovation for achieving the SDGs. This is a side event organized uh, in the, the fringes of the HLPF, the High Level Political Forum 2022, uh, or by the in UN Interagency Task Team uh, on, on SDI for the SDGs. And this is, in particular, this is the work stream uh, six on capacity development. Uh, my name is Fernando Santiago from UNIDO, and I will have the, the pleasure to moderate the, the session today. Uh, just a few remarks before we start. Uh, please, I will uh, ask the participants to, to keep their microphones uh, and the cameras off uh, when, you know, just so that we improve the connectivity and we make sure that only those who are talking uh, are, are really, uh, you know, being able to be listened. Right? Um, we had three three main blocks. Um, in addition to these uh, introductory remarks, we had three portions. The first one would be devoted to discuss very briefly on some of the what we call the global landscape on what is the, the need for uh, capacity development and some of the programs that exist out there to sort of reach some of the, the gaps uh, in terms of ability to do the you know, STI policies connected to SDGs. We will move on to a portion where the work stream six uh, will uh, update, will share some of the progress that we have made over the, the few years that we've been working together and to also share with you some of the plans for the future. And finally, uh, a, final, uh, a, a, a third portion where we will have some uh, entities who are also working uh, uh, on sort of capacity development issues uh, that we have been partnering with or that you know, we have some contacts and you know, to, to in the spirit of collaboration to, to share with us some of the ideas and how the, the initiative that we have uh, with us uh, can help uh, create synergies. And then, of course, a closing remarks. So uh, just without much of, uh, you know, uh, for ado, I would sort of uh, welcome uh, everybody again. Uh, the work stream six is, is uh, called it by uh, UNESCO and ONTAD. And so I will ask uh, my colleague, uh, Cornelia uh, from ONTAD uh, to, uh, to just give us some brief remarks and some introductory uh, words for the session. Nelly, please. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants and speakers, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to all of you joining us from around the world. Uh, it is my privilege and great pleasure to, on behalf of the interagency task team to welcome you at uh, uh, this side event on capacity building organized um, at the margins of the high level political forum. So the event is co-organized by the work stream on capacity building, which is comprised of various uh, UN entities and development par partners. Uh, we have um, the pleasure to, uh, to have in our group um, members and representatives from UNCTAD, uh, 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 from UNIDO, from UNESCO, from uh, UN University, WIPO, the UN Regional Economic Commissions, as well as the EU Joint Research Center. And I take the opportunity to thank uh, all, all members for their engagements and uh, collaboration for the past years. Uh, so the High Level Political Forum started its sessions uh, yesterday and reviewing the progress on the implementation of the Agenda 2030 but also calling upon stakeholders for uh, new partnerships, increased partnerships and joint actions. And this is why we are meeting today uh, to update you on our initiative, but also to hear views and uh, recommendations from technical partners on uh, how to explore new, uh, new partnerships and to also scale up our uh, programs and networks. Uh, we are honored to have esteemed uh, specialists from universities, development agencies and research institutes with us today. I wish to thank them all for bringing their perspectives and joining efforts with the interagency task team on capacity building. And now I hand over to Fernando uh, Santiago, our colleague from UNIDO, uh, who is our moderator today. And wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, I wonder if you want to show the, the video that sort of summarizing a little bit of the, 
the past years of the organization of the of the team. It's a video that uh, recovers some of the experiences and some of the trainings some of you might have been participating in. We want to work as one UN to bring this all the knowledge of our agencies. It was very comprehensive a capacity building workshop on STI for SDG. The UN agency all together to, to deliver uh, their point of view about STI for SDG. Science, technology and innovation are key for achieving the Agenda 2030. But for that, we need to build robust STI systems. The need for broad participation in the whole policy cycle not only in the policy design, but also in the policy implementation. Successful policy implementation requires that, actually, that the people who are implementing it are involved in the policy design. Producing science for decision making to be able to produce evidence based policy. STI policy instruments are the tools used to shape the economic activities and institutions to reach the goals set by the STI policy. When you're approaching in a development context the entirety of the STI, you have to focus on the I, give a decent consideration of the T, and leave the S basically where it is. It's fair to say that the lack of access to suitable financing can certainly be a major obstacle. It is just important how to translate some of the challenges in SDGs into uh, possibilities for making business and in that process contributing to address uh, poverty, and uh, issues around formalization. So if you talk about agriculture, health, education, industry, and other such relevant policies, there are IP elements that need to be taken into account in those policies. For us, smart specialization, what we consider priority domains for investments in research and in innovation, they are interdisciplinary. We have to think in politics of science, technology and innovation, inclusive in gender, in ancestral knowledge, in being able to tackle the challenge of knowledge, but also no dejar a nadie atrás. De todos los problemas, la forma que tenemos para responder es lanzando estos concursos, lo que limita un poco el campo de, de, de acción de, de, la, de las instituciones. I'd like you to invite more people like me to, to spread the knowledge and to have a, a standard approach to STI and SDGs. Tell me a bit about your priorities. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you for the, uh, you know, the short clip, but you know, that summarizes or is intended to summarize some of the uh, you know, past trainings and interactions we have had the chance to have with some of you, uh, and hopefully also motivate mm -hmm. some uh, further interaction in the future. But uh, let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's, let's move on now, try to cover some of the material that we have. It's a rich set of panelists. And so let me start with the first portion. And as I mentioned, the idea here is to discuss uh, a bit of the landscape, what we sort of consider are the, the, the capability uh, gaps that in, in terms of uh, STI policies. Uh, I have uh, four speakers and I will uh, ask you to kindly you know, keep your, to your remarks within you know, around four or five minutes so that we have some time left for discussion with the participants. Uh, for the participants, please, um, in the interest of, interest of time, please just put your your questions on the chat. Somebody else uh, from somebody from the team will be monitoring and we will collect uh, some of the questions and hopefully address. Uh, if you have any particular person who you, you would like to address the question, please uh, uh, indicate in the, in, in the chat and we will try to address as many as we can uh, either in this session or as we move progress in the program. Uh, so please, uh, we ha I've, I've had the pleasure to, with me. I have uh, Mr. Professor Rasigan Maraj. Uh, Chief Director of uh, the Institute for Economic Research and Innovation at Chibana University of Technology in South Africa. Uh, uh, Mr. Alessandro Velo, who is a member of the Technical Assistance Unit to the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the OICPS, uh, and he's part of the Research and Innovation Program. I also have Mr. Magnus Broad, as advisor at the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ, uh, Sector Project Trade and Investment for Sustainable Development. Uh, and finally, uh, not last but not least, I have uh, Mr. John Herrera. Uh, he's a student research team leader at the Department for Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy at University College London. 
And so I would uh, start with you, uh, uh, please, Vasigan. Uh, you can just share with us some ideas around, you know, the, the landscape of uh, capacity building needs, capacity gaps in terms of STI policy. Vasigan, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to all the colleagues for a very warm introduction. Um, as I know, we we are on a tight time frame, so please excuse me if I uh, uh, don't spend time on. Uh, introductory materials, but cut directly into the comments that I want to share with you. I have 16 distinct points to raise, so if if that's all right, Fernanda, if I can move ahead on that basis. Please. Yeah. As long as yeah. you are within time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So the contradictions, colleagues, that underpin contemporary world systems have rendered an extremely precarious situation that we all find ourselves in. And I'm Within this precarious situation, we are also witnessing overwhelming tendencies towards crises and catastrophes. So the domain of science and technology, and I would separate out innovation, uh, has gained significant credibility, legitimacy, as constituting core capacities, capabilities, and competences in framing domestic responses to the unfolding crises and catastrophes. The SDG process itself offers us collectively, all 8 billion of us, the only global multilateral uh, platform to engage substantively on institutional and policy transformations. Yeah. But I raise this also, colleagues, and uh, note that the discourse itself is becoming increasingly more technical and because of that also much more heavily dependent on particular skills. And there is a paucity of these sufficiently skilled and experienced policy scholars, practitioners who are schooled specifically in the economics of technical change, evolutionary economics and systems of innovation thinking. Yeah. This uneven distribution of these competencies on a global scale is most acute in and on the continent of Africa. And the reason I raise this in this particular form is, of course, because a key policy demand from African innovation systems is the need to redress the, ch uh, the chasm that exists between neoclassical macroeconomic planning and microeconomic strategizing with the tasks of rebuilding latent scientific capacities, technological capabilities, and innovation competences. Bringing these skill sets and improving public participation, very important point, helps improve trust. We've seen that in the video as well, in science, technology, and innovation, and affords better learning possibilities for advancing the SDG agenda. In fact, this gives us the basis for crafting the world that we want the world that we need, and colleagues, the world that we demand now. So the Institute for Economic Research on Innovation at Swanee University of Technology has worked well with the UN Interagency Task Team, albeit in a very rushed manner at the end of 2021. The IATT contributed to the Southern African Development Community's pilot training of SDI officials through uh, our UNESCO Chair in African Integration and Innovation. So as we move further uh, uh, into further elaborations of that Chair's program, I think it would be of immense value that we continue to work together, but that we work together on a more consistent basis, uh, drawing together the lessons from IATT from across the world so that we can draw down on this for the benefit of Africa and African countries specifically. So towards this end, it is and remains imperative that IATT work more closely with domestic knowledge agencies in Africa to share these experiences and give us the collective benefit of the work that IATT is doing. You know, colleagues, uh, questions of transformation are not just about getting us uh, to fit into what exists at present, but also includes very serious topics of decolonization of curricula 
and the decoloniality of praxis through which we operate. These are opportunities in advancing our collective work, but also redressing the epistemicide that excludes indigenous and traditional knowledges and in its current incarnation, sadly, privileges institutions of the global north over those of the global south. The relevance and trust in the IATT will follow on the basis of such progressive partnerships uh, being at the core, Fernando, in the work that's taken forward. Yeah. Swan University of Technology, our Institute for Economic Research and Innovation, and the UNESCO Chair on African Integration and Innovation, therefore looks forward to working together with the IATT and the partners that, have, that are convened in this panel. Yeah. I really wish us all well, you know, colleagues. I hope it doesn't sound as dire as I feel it in my head at the moment. You know, our very existence on this planet is under threat. It's not the planet. It's us on the planet. And for us to defend ourselves as a species being, we really have to embrace the opportunities to transform those elements of what surrounds us that are contributing against sustainability. In other words, we have the possibilities of working together towards an ecological civilization that embraces us all. The IATT offers an opportunity for us to collectivize our learning and improve its impact. And thank you very much, Fernando, and I hope I've kept to your time limit. Thank you, thank you. It's okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Rasigan, especially for this sort of trip from you know the macro to the macro and the, the, the from the global to the regional and local perspectives. Let me move on now. Thank you, Fernando, here again to Mr. Uh, Alessandro Velo. Uh, Alessandro, uh, you know. You're, you have a very broad constituency and, and some of the issues of climate change that uh, Rasigan uh, raised. But I mean, can you share some of the uh, views from your organization perspective? Alessandro, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. I hope that you can uh, hear me very clearly. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to this um, side event. Very timely, actually, and, uh, and needed. And I know that I do not have a lot of time, so all protocols observed and well, within the framework of the research and innovation uh, policy super facility of the organization of the Africa and Caribbean Pacific states, the OECPS, we actually have witnessed and especially collected some information about the challenges that several countries in Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific are going through. But let me start with something, say something at the beginning. There have been a lot of efforts also of developing countries towards announcing their national and ecosystems. But it's also true that there are many that are still underperforming on their innovation potential and different challenges are also still pending, of course. And uh, one of the most common issues that we have uh, seen is the fragmented national r and ecosystems, usually linked among STI stakeholders, government, uh, academia, industry, society using the quadrupedalics model. It, are really not well established or very weak with many silos. I mean, there is really this uh, silos mentality that is very strong and also linkages between research institutions and, uh, and other actors in the innovation systems are also weak. In addition, many countries, the technological capabilities of firms are still underdeveloped. And there is also some kind of need for revamp SDI policy capacities. That's because sometimes uh, there is a little comprehension of uh, SDGs among its research, development and policy makers. We have been observed that SDGs, as well as other, other international and regional frameworks, such as uh, the, the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, uh, are being included into the RNI policies. But there are always good statements, but sometimes there are lack of uh, understanding on how it can be really implemented. There are still lacks of the gaps uh, between SDI also for SDGs. And there are also a gap and uh, need for more strengthening human capital for the uptake of research and development. We need also to focus on commercialization of research. It, in many countries, we have seen that the main typical outputs are research papers, publications and prototypes. But there are still issues in the development management process of innovation, commercialization methods. Also in the startups and SMEs, 
there are still uh, some challenges that they are facing. It's not just a matter of lack of recognition, the lack of funding. It's really more a matter of uh, capacity building access to market, uh, training and advocacy, information asymmetry, and, and the skills development. We have all seen, I think, the, the, the mismatch between academia and industry. And for funding, there is still more especially in a certain type of funding that are still missing, such as early stage venture funding or risk funding, impact investment, a mechanism for the risk. And also, I mean, it's not the problem is not, not always a matter of uh, investing more, but it's always, always a matter of investing better and put in place the right policy framework conditions. And I think that also in this framework that the Secretariat of the OECPS launched the, the policy support facility in 2021 within uh, the, with the support of the European Union. And they were really aiming at uh, enhancing the national RNI ecosystems uh, in order to, with the uh, Taylor may support because each country has he different no needs, different knowledge, and uh, and so different, um, and they know better than anybody else what these needs are, and so they provide basically this specific and ad hoc uh, high level expertise and support. But it's not all. Uh, there is also the bright side. In many ACP countries, uh, what we have seen before is. Uh, I said it, there is a political will to support STI, but there is also a vibrant uh, ecosystem, in, 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 especially in the, in the recent years, uh, many initiatives uh, to support uh, innovative startups or government incentives uh, for market led -like innovation, products and services have appeared. But also, especially we talk about uh, young, a relatively young population. Well, I would always add uh, we have seen many talented people also. We need to unlock their capital, their, with their capacity, especially to catching the new technology wave of the industry 4.0. But in order to unlock this potential, we need uh, more also capacity reinforcement also for policymakers. To overcome challenge in SDI for SDGs, of course, but uh, also because a weak capacity in national administration could be a barrier for implementation. We have seen many, many very good policies that were lacking implementation. So if we wanted to develop and to effective personalization of the SDI policy and strategies, we need not only all the SDI actors at national level, but also the regional and international organization that could play a very important role. Because really, if we have a wide cooperation, we can tackle both local and global challenges. And this is also because we, we are glad that we are starting collaboration with the UN Yacht, UNESCO, UNCTAD, towards exchanging knowledge on how to develop and especially implement RNI policy and strategies and strengthen also capacities uh, to overcome challenges in SDI policy for SDGs. I, I really believe, and I'll conclude with this, sorry, that the exchange of knowledge within countries and the collaboration of international, international, regional, international partners can really be beneficial for national authorities and can really contribute to further strengthen capacities for a real better in uh, implementation. And with this, really, I, I conclude and I thank you and I give you the floor to you, um, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you very much for this uh, very rich set of uh, comments on you know, from capacities to human beings, investments, and you know the regional perspective. So thank you, thank you, Alessandro. And also, you've been part of the team, so I guess you understand the, the challenges. Right? So thank you very much. Now I'd like to move on now to uh, Mr. Magnus uh, Broad. Uh, you know, from the perspective of an uh, agency like the IZ, uh, what would be the sort of the messages that you would like to share with us, uh, Mr. Magnus? The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Fernando, for giving me the word and having me here and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, as you might know, GIZ is one of the agencies um, that implements Germany's ODA on the ground. And, and we are a project-based implementation agency and we have offices in 120 mostly developing countries worldwide. And uh, in most cases, um, we implement the projects of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and um, development. Now, let me say something about um, the landscape of the GRZ uh, engagement. Um, we are concerned with building capacity for STI policy development in our partner countries, um, and especially in the area of um, environmentally sound technologies and information and in communications. Um, here, um, 
uh, and the um, and we believe this these areas are crucial. It is crucial because these areas, the um, environmental sound technologies and information, the communication technology, is the key in unlocking the benefits of STI in achieving the SDGs. Um, and these uh, benefits include the acceleration, the pace of economic diversification, the ecological transformation, and of course, improving the productivity and competitiveness. And ultimately, uh, enable developing countries, enable our partner countries uh, to fostering sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Um, for Germany's development cooperation concerning the SCI policy, two areas are the main focus, digitalization and climate change. Um, the overall project portfolio that we have uh, in this field is constantly expanding um, and we also have implemented a digital by default approach. Um, so issues concerning digitalizations are reflected in all of our projects. Um, now to move on to a little bit more concrete um, example, let me highlight one instance which shows where we see the case for action, i.e. where we can highlight the gap and see how we as SGRZ address it. And this is the Digital Transformation Center a project in Tunisia. Here in the last years, the digital sector has seen a phenomenal expansion. But um, at the same time, the public sector, the Tunisian administration, um, uh, was, was not always able to, to follow this, this evolution at this rapid pace that we have observed. So the project seeks to address the capacity gaps caused by the acceleration pace of the change in the new technology sector and also address the risk called by digital transformation in the public sector. So um, what the project then is doing is, is trying to enable the regulators and the policymakers to develop the most efficient um, policies around the issue of digital transformation and hence maximize the uh, socioeconomic benefits for Tunisia. Um, as you as you've seen, um, we are a project-based organization, and so our strength is is we are on the ground, uh, and we have a usually a strong cooperation with with our partners there, and especially in this uh, uh, digital uh, skills project in Tunisia, um, we aim at capacity building through offering training courses um, developed for these exclusively for the regulators, for the policymakers and the government officials. And um, so actually, let me highlight um, where we also um, combine our forces with um, IATT, with the Workstream 6. So we are very grateful to team up with them um, to combine their contents uh, in the field of SDI policy um, with, with our presence on the ground by delivering their contents uh, in cooperation um, to our partners that we work with in, uh, in Tunisia. So um, we are actually right now in the process of, of organizing uh, training in, in uh, October this year. Um, so perhaps um, if, if you're interested, you can also reach, reach out. You maybe uh, want to, to listen in, tune in. And we want to see this, um, how, it, how it works, how we can transfer these um, knowledge from and the contents from the Workstream 6 uh, to our partners there. And, and perhaps even like in the future, see how we can uh, scale up this, this uh, cooperation. And yeah, let me just close um, by, by thanking uh, the Workstream 6 um, for providing us with this um, example of the synergies in the development cooperation between the multilateral system, um, the different UN agencies who are involved in the project, and the bilateral system, in this case GIZ with our Tunisian partners, um, to uh, benefit uh, the Tunisian road to, to development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you very much. And also for this uh, sort of very positive uh, perspective engaging with, with us. Uh, and, and let me just, uh, in the interest of time, we are running a little bit behind time. Uh, just uh, before I, I give the floor to, to John uh, for his intervention, may I remind, the, remind please the participants to keep your, your microphones and your cameras off uh, while you are not speaking, because then that improves the experience for everybody. So I, I would really like to to ask uh, your help in that. Uh, John, can you, I mean, you have a, a rich sort of a study uh, on, on the work that we have done and you have the sort of the findings. Maybe you can share some of the highlights from that study. Uh, thank I'm, you, John. I'm going to share my screen and at first you should see an island with two dots, but that will change now because I'll be, you should see my um, title screen. So yes, can everybody yes, yes. just to confirm? Yes, we can see it. So please, please go ahead. I'll start now. 
So good afternoon, everyone. I'm John. I'm an alumni from UCLA, and I will be presenting our group project called Mapping the SDI Policy Capacity Building Initiatives and Exploring Its Transformative Value for the SDGs. This project was done in collaboration with UNESCO. And this would not be possible without my amazing group mates. They are on the screens, our supervisor, Jason Ina, and also Cornelia and Zenmei. In the next five minutes, I will be presenting our findings on the global landscape for SDI capacity building initiatives, the value of SDI for SDG capacity building of UN IATD trainings, and our recommendations. Now to our findings, the global SDI capacity building. So I need to share our definition for SDG connections, and they come in the form of three high, medium, and low. Low means that the sustainability is a minor aspect of the content. Medium means a greater focus on sustainability, but has little to no explicit connection to SDGs. And high means the SDG is the heart of the initiative or the main theme of the content. So the majority of SDI capacity building initiatives do not mention SDGs as the main aspect of their programs. So this used to be a thousand uh, data, data and we um, distilled and processed it into uh, around 100. We found that, that the target audience of the initiatives are catered mostly towards professionals and students, then a smaller amount to the general audience. It presents a challenge that the barriers of entries are high because of the participants needs to be in a certain network or industry, or for the students needs to pay a tuition fee. Now, if you look at the graphs, most initiatives are in the form of a workshop, short course, and degrees while there are there seems to be a gap for MOOCs and guidebooks. Most of the data came from academic institutions, but despite this, the connection to SDG remains low. NGO comes in second and delivers the second highest connection to the SDGs. And government agencies and public organization has some catching up to do. So looking at the map, there is a high number of initiative with strong connection to the SDGs from Western countries. Um, so our key takeaways from are the lack of training types and audience. NGO remains to be the most aligned with the SDGs and most initiatives are developed in the West and the content of the initiative may be too broad or lacks the local context. Our recommendations are to utilize more of the online platforms like MOOCs or have more degrees, having greater link interlinkages across different societal actors and the SDGs to have more contextual priorities to fit the local uh, narrative. So that's the data from the internet. Now onwards to the SDI cap policy capacity building for the SDGs in the UNIDT. So we conducted interview to get a sense of the value, uh, the value challenges and suggested improvements to the initiatives from the UNID. The value that the participant gained more practical knowledge and found the case study and best practice in different contexts to be useful. Participants receive a greater awareness of SDI policy and how to align them to the SDGs and also integrating SDGs to their national strategy and creating an enabling environment for SDI for SDGs. Participants improve their capabilities to design and implement policies. They also enjoyed learning the different challenges and solutions from other regions. And lastly, the diversity of the UNIAT and it brought, has brought them different perspectives to think of and the importance of a closer uh, collaboration. While the challenges are the participants' seniority or the knowledge gap within the audience, an hour may not be enough or it's too short. The context is too broad. There's the lack of interactivity between participants and audiences and the lack of resources to supplement initiatives. They also would like to see more guidebooks, context to their region or domain and other related topic and other topics related to entrepreneurship. So we also did some surveys and found that most of the participants are satisfied from the initiatives and found it useful to their work, but they also want to see more topics related to education, technology and innovation and implementation of the SDGs. So here's our recommendations. So finally, the workshop brings a lot of value, but the long term impact is uncertain and there needs to be uh, to have a longer partnership to assess the impact by having a consistent feedback mechanism. Online platforms must be utilized more to create a standalone learning resources like MOOCs and provide supplementary learning, um, learning materials after the workshops. And we stress the importance of having uh, different um, contextual prior. Um, we stress the importance of having different contextual priorities 
and a closer collaboration with um, different actors in the local region to personalize the conference. Wow. So, so this is the last slide. If you if you would like to see our data set we worked on, um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows how to use a QR code, so just scan them. And uh, But I will also paste a link in the chat. So if you have uh, any more questions, please leave them on the chat and our moderators will pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for the impressive uh, hand management of time management, and you had a very rich presentation. And of course, I, I am sure that many, many more questions will come. Uh, thank you very much for the, this uh, intervention. Uh, we don't have much time to, to open the script. Please, uh, I see some questions already coming in the chat. We will collect them and address at the end, just in the interest of time. Uh, I would just now pass the, the, the floor to my colleague, Nival, who will moderate this second block, and then we, we with it on with me after the for the third block. Thank you, Nival. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm really happy to participate in this session. As member of IE, IATT, I represent uh, UNESCO. I'm chief of the innovation section at uh, at ESQUA. Um, I would like to the, during this part of the of this uh, side event, we will focus mainly on the the work of the that is done by uh, this work stream six, which focus on STI for SDG and which include uh, it is led by, as we have said, it is led by UNCTAD and UNESCO and it includes 12 UN agencies as well as some partner, external partner, other partner. Then uh, I will, I'm happy to, in this session to 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 have uh, four distinguished speaker. Uh, Mr. Uh, I have and I invite them to put on the camera uh, to to see them. I mean, I have uh, in this uh, session, Mr. Clovis Prairier from uh, from UNCTAD, and uh, he is the chief. Uh, Mr. Prairier, he is the economist at the Science Technology Innovation Policy Section in the Division of Te on Technology and Logistics at UNCTAD. And we have in this session as well, Mr. Fernando Santiago, who is our moderator, and he is uh, industry uh, industrial policy officer at UNIDO. Um, then, and we have uh, the pleasure to have in this uh, this part also uh, our co our partner from uh, European Commission uh, uh, European Commission Joint Research Center. We have Ms. Monica Matsu Mat Matsuyak, who is team leader for smart specialization and the global out in the Territorial Development Unit in the European Commission Joint Research Center. And we have also Ms. Angela Sar Sarsina, who is economic, economic and Policy Analyst at the ter Territorial Development Unit in the European Commission GRC. Uh, I welcome you all and uh, to and I hope that uh, you will present for us more a deeper look about our the activity and I will start we will start with Mr. Clovis uh, Frerier from uh, from UNCTAD who will present us uh, will give us a highlight about the activity that has been implemented in this work stream and also give us some lesson learned about this experience. Clovis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nibal. So, uh, as I said, I, will, I would like to share with you a brief summary of the recent activities of the work stream. Um, we have, uh, since 2018, we have organized uh, six training activities in either presential or, of, or online format. The, the purpose of the online training sessions was to build awareness and understanding concerning the key aspects of STI policy and instruments, as well as innovation and entrepreneurship process and how they relate to the SDGs, but also how they relate to COVID-19, because we had that the development of these online training sessions during the, the, the initial phase and in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the sessions had this objective to engage participants, not only the interactive discussions and practice, practical reflections on existing approach, case studies, and national experience, but also how to uh, establish and manage STI in the context of global and, and unprecedented crisis. So through these sessions, uh, we in the work stream, we were able to first to share knowledge and practice using different methodological approaches of the different UN agencies for policy making and implementation of STI policies. Second, we we're able to further highlight the importance of transparent, participatory, inclusive, and evidence-based STI policy-making process to address national development priorities and the SDGs. 
Third, we, we stress the importance of establishing appropriated and well-balanced policy mix and of instruments and means to implement those STI policies. And fourth, to increase awareness that productive actors, not private enterprise, public firms, small and medium-sized enterprise, farmers, inventors, entrepreneurs, are all crucial to re responding to global crisis and contributing to achievement of the SDGs through innovation. In terms of um, geographic coverage, the, our activities, they really cover wide the geographic uh, part there. We have one presential training in the Arab region, one presential and two online trainings for the Latin American Caribbean countries, one online training for the SADC region, and one online training at the international level with participants of our regions. Uh, the work stream also organized two side events at the UN STI forum sessions in 2021 and 2018. Um, if we take a look on the uh, people that we reach with this training, we have more than uh, 500 participants from over 90 countries that were reached by these trainings. And we are very pleased to see the gender balance with 53% female representation. Since we had in total three sessions focused on Latin American Caribbean region, the majority of the participants were from that region, so with almost 60%. But we also had a significant uh, uh, number of almost 20% uh, of participants that come from the African region. Uh, if we um, if we take a look and we see that these trainings were very well received, as, as mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, and we see that also attested by the follow-up surveys that we had asking for comments by participants on the training. So many have indicated that they will directly use the knowledge acquired on these trainings on their work in relation to STI policy and strategy design and implementation. And for example, I bring here I would like to share with you these two examples of feedback from participants to the question, how do you plan to use your work, uh, use in your work the knowledge gained in these sessions? And we see, for example, a participant from Bhutan on the 2020 online training wrote, since Bhutan is yet to have the STI policy as a mother document, the knowledge gain will be very useful. It gave me the sense of how I should go about pro proposing the policy. And a participant from Ukraine from the same online training noted that we will take this knowledge into account when we design the STI roadmap for Ukraine. So we are very pleased to see that uh, the, the uh, um, trainings have this direct uh, effect on, on the work of the participants. Um, if we also, I can also share with you some feedback in relation to takeaway message that we have gathered in the 2021 SADAC training. And they highlight in a way among other things, that uh, the importance of policy coherence and synergies, the usefulness of sharing experience from different regions to give some ideas of possible line of action. Also, this challenge of policy implementation in the critical role of monitoring and evaluation. Um, I believe it is difficult to often emphasize that the work stream is at the core of the technology facilitation mechanism because its main purpose is to bring together at the working level the UN system and partners to create STI capacities and mobilize STI activities as fundamental components for national strategies for attaining the SDGs. So the work stream brings together UN specialized agencies with STI mandates and regional commissions to cooperate on capacity building STI for SDGs. The IATT is currently composed of diverse I entities and, and the ones listed here have provided enormous support to the work of the work stream in terms of staff time and other resources. A common understanding of the group is that it can, we can do even more in terms of building capacity in developing countries if we are able to further mobilize resources and attract other partners to join forces with us. So events as this one today are really a great opportunity for us to explore these partnerships and get additional commitments to this work. Thank you very much, Nivo. I stop here. Thank you very much, Clovis, for this uh, interesting and concise presentation about the, the, the work that has been implemented and some feedback from the, the participant in this uh, in this in this in this workshop and this activity. 
Um, I think there are some questions uh, about the material and speaking about the material that the work stream is working on. In fact, uh, during the, the life cycle, uh, during the, the since 2018 till now, we have provide, prepared and developed a lot of material and maybe one of the material that uh, was prepared recently and that uh, represent a little bit uh, a compilation of what we are uh, delivering as message as work stream six is a brochure uh, about STI uh, for SDG and it's a, a kind of guidelines for policy formulation. I'm happy to invite F Fernando uh, to, to present uh, this, uh, this guidelines, which is available online and it is available on our website. Mr. Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nibal. Can you see the, the, the slide up? Just, yes. just one slide and I will be brief in my time. Uh, yes, and I thank you, David, for the question. Yes, uh, some of the, the ideas that we had is, uh, you know, people always get interested in the PowerPoints and additional material to learn. So uh, over the, the years we have, uh, you know, conducted several trainings and, and we decided with, uh, with, the, uh, with the support, I mean, something that, you know, Claudius mentioned very briefly is, you know, we bring as a different entities, we bring our own resources and staff time and, you know, uh, some of the assets we have. Uh, and in that in that sense, uh, UNIDO decided to sponsor with the support from the government of Korea, uh, a, a document that could synthesize or sort of capturing one single piece, a very quick reference piece, uh, some of the, the, con the, the content uh, of, of instead of, you know, asking participants to go over uh, long hours of recording which are available online and I would sort of, I guess, uh, send may already share with you the, the link to the website. But in this brochure, we try to, to synthesize learning with taking as a reference the, the, the policy cycle, the policy making cycle you know, from the diagnostics of the initial stock taking of the problems to, you know, the idea of setting the strategy, the policy, uh, thinking about instruments, thinking about implementation, then of course monitoring and evaluation, but just the connection with the SDGs. And so we decided to produce this document that synthesizes synthesizes some of those uh, lessons and for a, sort of a quick reference and some of the, the key messages that we have here, um, moving as I said from the the policy formulation to the actual evaluation with some cases uh, in boxes that can illustrate some how how these things work when they come how the instruments how processes of decision making of implementation work in real life setting particularly focusing on developing countries across different regions and so some of the key messages just to to summarize is really just the, the reminding us the the importance of uh, STI uh, in connection with the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, right? So the STI provides the evidence base uh, for us to understand the challenges, opportunities around the, SDI, the SDGs. Uh, we also know that effective STI policy requires STI systems, you know, uh, but STI systems that not only a, a, a geared towards economic uh, benefit, but also the sort of consideration of sustainability and social economic transformation. Uh, uh, earlier on, somebody mentioned this idea of, you know, science and technology splitting from innovation. And so we really need to emphasize uh, the evolution of the concept, right? Now we talk about STI, but in the past we, we talk about science, technology, innovation. Each of them has different logics, different ways of operate. We try to capture a bit of that uh, and how these get involved in the different stages of the policy cycle, right? But some of the elements that we want to emphasize, and, and that's part of the training, so this idea of directionality, that you have to have an intention, a strategy uh, uh, to really target some of the, the goals, and those goals need to be uh, inspired or at least driven by the SDGs. The, the use of evidence, multi stakeholder participation, a sort of a democratic process. And then, of course, the importance that something sometimes we forget, you know, uh, policy making is also about uncertainty, about learning and experimentation. And so we provide some of the, the sort of the rationale for that in the document. Um, and then, of course, the ideas of, you know, uh, different problems require different instruments, but instruments don't operate in isolation. You have to have uh, ideas of policy mix. So the document is available online already. I will post, post the, the link in the chat. It's already available in English and Spanish, and we are trying to get ready the, the version in French. So uh, it's up to the, there for, for you to, to, you know, to go over, and any feedback will be most, most welcome. And I will stop there, Anyone? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernando, for this uh, for this uh, presentation, very concise presentation. And uh, in fact, it is really very interesting to read the, the, the brochure. There is a kind of uh, distinction between science, technology, innovation, how, how they are merged together. I, I really invite you all to read it. It is really very, uh, very, very interesting document. Uh, the European Commission's 
Joint Research Center was really a key member and uh, in the IATT, and uh, they have collaborated with the UN entity in the framework of the work stream six. And uh, I am here inviting Miss Monica Matusiak, Matusiak uh, to uh, who is the leader uh, team leader for smart specialization and the global outreach to present her uh, to give us some insight about her experience with IA, IATT and uh, some lesson learned from this experience and I, I hope that the pronunciation was correct <laughs> of your name. Thank you very much Nival. Yes, uh, uh, the, the last version was uh, was the right one and thank you for making the effort because it's obviously not uh, not so easy. Um, I would like to share just a few words uh, from the experience of um, the Joint Research Center of European Commission uh, of the cooperation of works in uh, works in six of um, UN EITT. Because for us, uh, as a non-EU entity, it was, uh, I think, a, a particular uh, learning challenge and reaching experience. And um, I think uh, we uh, developed something quite important together and we are very eager to uh, to go on. So, so the first thing I wanted to mention is that throughout our work uh, in the European Commission, but also where my team works in the global dimension of, of European innovation policies, uh, we have learned that indeed uh, institutional but also stakeholder capacities are crucial. Uh, we won't have effective STI policies, uh, neither S, neither T, neither I, uh, working if we don't build those capacities that are actually not only uh, for public policy makers for governments, but also they have to be later distributed in the research and innovation ecosystems. Um, in this context, uh, it is of particular importance uh, uh, to bring the STI for SDGs into, into this context because uh, this is still a particular, um, particularly novel concept. We don't have so much uh, experience as institutions and globally uh, to really build it up because it's not just generic STI, it's a very special STI. And even listening to the insights from the, um, uh, yesterday's STI session during, during this AGLPF, uh, we heard messages such as we need to look for inclusive, for ethical, for affordable innovation. And I think SDGs uh, bring those messages really uh, very much into the context. So I think this joint effort um, to, to create, uh, in a way, a program with associated tools, uh, with associated institutional knowledge for STI, for SDGs capacity building is, is very useful. We very much appreciate the collaboration with uh, Workstream 6 uh, uh, because it really allows to combine insights from the key agencies that work on this topic. Uh, agencies, partners, I won't be, uh, they were already mentioned here, so I won't be um, listing them all as there are many, but what I wanted to um, to point out as a thing of spe special value for us is uh, the, the notion of localization and adapt adaptation to different contexts because obviously there is some general body of knowledge and some of our partners and institutions here work uh, in very different uh, global contexts but uh, some of them especially the regional commissions for example and other organizations they really bring the knowledge of the specific context and challenges and we already saw that depending where we go, is it Latin America, is it Arab region, is it, is it SADC, sometimes the messages, the practices, the um, uh, what we want to share uh, really has to be has to be adjusted uh, also at national and subnational level. So, so I think bringing us all together created um, valuable synergies and uh, we have done a lot. I think at this stage, and this is my personal assessment, but uh, we have a stable, a stable program of trainings uh, that has uh, some messages that uh, has increasing number of associated tools and guiding materials that we are still working on. Uh, so probably what are the, the challenges for the future? Uh, I think going on, first of all, uh, spreading the message, uh, sharing them, sharing them higher and probably what we already started discussing coming back um, also to in-person trainings uh, to, to recreate this physical uh, uh, learning experience uh, and new networks and new contacts, uh, but also if we if we really think further, um, I, I think listening to some participants of our trainings has been very insightful uh, for myself as well, um, and I deeply appreciated how many of them are already quite knowledgeable about uh, what is missing in the STI ecosystems, uh, about some key feature, uh, features of, of the STI policy they should focus on building on the um, the future policies. Um, 
this is probably a good moment to start really thinking about capacities for implementation, to really focus on how to do it, uh, uh, not maybe so much what, because there is already a lot of evidence done, but as a next step to really uh, try to find good examples uh, uh, to, to understand and discuss better how those examples can be adapted to different contexts, because we all know they cannot be just transferred from, from one, uh, one, one part to, uh, to another. So, um, I think uh, this, this, is, this is the reflection I wanted to share. Uh, thank you very much for having us, uh, for uh, allowing us also to, to join this, um, this trip. And from uh, the, the side of Joint Research Center, we are very happy to contribute to, to this joint work by what was already mentioned as a needed um, future step, uh, uh, MOOC, uh, Massive Online Open Course, that we are presently working on in cooperation with our colleagues from, from working Workstream 6. Uh, and um, uh, my colleague Angela will uh, very shortly present and share with you. So I finish here uh, just to, to, to be able to share some insights where we are and when uh, can we expect the MOOC to be, to be ready. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you for your insight. It is really very useful and I like uh, what is very imp interesting in the work stream six, uh, this uh, variation in the, that we are covering all the region or region in the world. And therefore there is the, uh, I mean, taking, uh, I mean, example from one country to another or from one region to another is really very interesting. And uh, in the brochure, we have many examples from the, re from different region in the, in the world. Um, we Without further, uh, I would like to. Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our last speaker, but not least, I mean, uh, Ms. Angela Sarcina, who is economic and policy analyst in e ECGRC. Uh, Moni, uh, Angela, the the floor is yours. Please. Thank you, Nibal. Thank you very much, and thank you, colleagues, for for the kind invitation. Um, I, I'm very pleased to, to present and uh, to talk a bit um, about the, the MOOC that uh, was just mentioned by, by Monica and especially after the, uh, the presentation that John uh, did uh, a while ago, from John from UCL, um, expressing the uh, importance and, uh, and the need for a, a massive online uh, open course. Um, so, well, um, in, the, in the past year, uh, we have started uh, working with uh, the ITT colleagues of this uh, work stream for the development of uh, the massive online open course on STI for SDGs. And uh, uh, we consider it uh, to be a, a useful tool that will uh, uh, complement uh, the in-presence and online courses already uh, successfully developed and deployed uh, by, by this work stream. Um, the idea is to uh, provide a capacity building tool that will raise uh, uh, the policymakers understanding on new trends uh, in, uh, um, in the approaches used uh, to leverage uh, STI for the SDGs. Uh, it will build on the on the resources and experiences that we have collected so far um, by also by other uh, UN ITT work streams, and I'm referring in particular to the work stream on uh, STI for SDGs roadmaps, uh, to which we we contribute as well. Uh, we we are uh, in in the in this work stream as well, uh, and I'm referring in particular to the to the guidebook for the preparation of STI for SDGs roadmaps and the country case uh, cases that were. Uh, um, collected uh, in the context of the global pilot program uh, for STI for SDGs roadmaps. Um, the preparation of the MOOC has already um, benefited a lot from uh, the, the expertise, ideas, uh, knowledge uh, of, uh, of many of the colleagues that are present today. Um, later in the process, uh, we also hope and we aim actually to, to have uh, members of this uh, work stream uh, on capacity building to be involved uh, in the uh, in the recording of videos uh, and uh, providing inputs uh, uh, that will be featuring uh, in the in the MOOC, and they will be expected to provide provide their perspectives uh, both uh, methodologically, but but also from uh, field experiences in uh, in STI for SDGs uh, policy development. Um, where we stand with this uh, with this course, well, um, the course is now under development. Uh, we we will be ready by end of this year. Uh, its structure will uh, will focus uh, will uh, follow mainly the the steps uh, of the STI for SDGs roadmap uh, guidebook that I mentioned before. 
Um, so we will uh, we will we will follow the the whole uh, cycle going from uh, the the definition of uh, objectives uh, and targets uh, to to the design of the of the roadmap or, or, and identification of policy mix, uh, but also the the definition of uh, monitoring and evaluation frameworks uh, and uh, uh, also of course uh, implementation. Uh, the MOOC will be complemented as I as I mentioned by um, uh, inputs. Uh, uh, provided by uh, partner countries, uh, UN agencies and other organizations, especially in, in terms of uh, methodologies, approaches, uh, experiences that they can provide. Um, actually, all the all the modules will have uh, a, a similar structure. Um, each module will uh, uh, reflect one step of the um, of the policy cycle of the of the guidebook uh, um, uh, for the preparation of SCI for SDGs roadmaps, um, and uh, the the structure will be uh, with an introduction, of course, of the of the topic, the main uh, learning objectives. Uh, then uh, we will have a presentation of the main. Uh, concepts uh, followed by uh, experiences from uh, from countries uh, or from uh, from agencies and finally uh, some uh, some questions for reflection in order to uh, engage uh, the the participants and uh, allow for uh, immediate uh, um, uh, reaction on the topics that are covered during the um, the, the module uh, the, mod, the, the MOOC will be a self-paced uh, learning course uh, divided in seven or eight modules at the moment. It will be uh, uh, in English with subtitles in uh, at least uh, six languages. Um, it, it's um, the, the, the participants uh, that we expect uh, will be following the, the MOOC will be mainly policymakers, as I mentioned, but also, of course, uh, STI practitioners and other uh, stakeholders that wish to use uh, these concepts or are willing to understand uh, new trends uh, on STI for SDGs. Um, it's true that uh, it's uh, the JRC uh, European Commission developing the, the MOOC, but uh, it's not only addressed uh, to the European Union. Uh, the idea is to, to go beyond uh, uh, in terms of uh, scope and uh, reach uh, to, to a global audience, uh, especially in countries with uh, um, less institutional capacities. So yeah, I will, uh, I will stop here. Uh, we are looking forward to, to sharing the content with, uh, mm -hmm. with our colleagues uh, to, to start preparing the, the, videos of, the videos of the modules and uh, we look forward to, to keep been working together on this uh, initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angela. It is really, uh, we are all waiting uh, this uh, MOOC to be read, ready, uh, starting by myself. And I think many of our participants are waiting till the end of the year to have this, uh, this course online. Uh, I think it is very instrumental to have online uh, courses self-based. I think it is the, the way that we are going uh, in the world uh, normally, and it has been seen during COVID, uh, how online uh, training is really uh, instrumental for our days. Uh, I thank all the panelists. Uh, I think we have some uh, some questions that we will answer directly uh, on the chat. Uh, but uh, uh, to uh, I will I would like really to thank the participants for their question, and we will answer them. And I want to thank all the panelists. And I return back to my to Fernando, who is the moderator of the third part. Please, Fernando. Thank you, thank you, Nival. Thank you very much. And I, I am happy to see there is already some, uh, you know, discussion interaction in the chat. Please continue uh, as we move along. It's always limited time, but uh, it's, it's good to see the conversation. And and I'm, I'm sorry, like we cannot really, uh, you know, open the mic for everybody. But I mean, the, the chat is is for the use for for the, the exchanges with us. So uh, without further ado, let's let's move on to the third uh, uh, portion of the event, uh, where we will now have some of the entities that are also working on these areas of you know building capacities either from a university perspective or sort of funders or, or organizations uh, government organizations uh, and we would like to sort of address some of the questions around you know how do they see uh, again uh, uh, this uh, policy 
gaps or, or uh, sort of policy capacities that need to build uh, and the kinds of uh, actions that could be uh, also conducive to have some more uh, collaboration and, and synergies with the, some initiatives such as the, the ITT Workstream 6. And, and for that, I will have uh, six speakers, so I will really kindly ask you to keep your interventions around three, three minutes, four minutes maximum, so that we can uh, remain. Professor Carlo Petrovello, who is Professor Dean of uh, the Department of Economics, University of Roma 3 in Italy, and a professor and fellow at the Union of the United Nations University. I have also Chuck Daniels, director of the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, uh, Africa Hope at the Science Policy Research Unit, SPRU, University of Sussex uh, Business School in the UK. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilhelmina Quay, director of the CSIR, Science and Technology Policy Research Institute in Ghana. Uh, professor uh, Tom Ogada, uh, uh, executive director of the African Center for Technology Studies uh, Acts in Kenya. Uh, uh, professor uh, Halimaton Hamdan, Chair of the Governing Board of the uh, International Science, Technology and Innovation Center for South-South uh, ISTIC in Malaysia. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, good, good friend, uh, uh, David O'Brien, Senior Program Specialist at the IDRC, International Development Research Center in Canada. If I um, can give you the floor, please, uh, Carlo, uh, for your brief intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando. Thank you, um, organizers. On, uh, uh, you know, I'm a professor at the University of Rome, but I'm also a professorial fellow at uh, UNU, United Nations University in Maastricht, UNU Merit. And uh, at UNU Merit, we are heavily involved in, in training and capacity building on science, technology, innovation, and sustainable development. Uh, we do a number of things, a number of activities that are very much complementary, and I'm sure uh, we'll be able to contribute to the uh, joint effort of uh, the various uh, agencies and donors and and uh, stakeholders uh, that are meeting around the table. Uh, we have uh, a, a master in public policy. We have uh, uh, um, um, an evidence based uh, um, uh, uh, program that is uh, especially focused on uh, a blended training program with uh, part uh, part time activities in presence and 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 a lot of activities online that is specifically oriented to policymakers and professionals uh, to teach them the basics of research and supporting them in the in translating the the big questions that they face in their policy uh, work uh, into research uh, questions and trying to address research questions with their uh, research and, and, and thesis. Um, we have uh, uh, short term programs like uh, the, the, the DEIP, the Design and Evaluation of Innovation Policies, which is directly oriented towards uh, uh, developing countries governments uh, where we organize uh, one week intensive trainings uh, on science, technology uh, and innovation policy that are usually tailored to the specific needs and requirements of, of uh, the individual governments. And most importantly, we also have uh, uh, a big PhD program with uh, full-time PhD uh, as well as uh, part-time uh, PhD, a program we call uh, GPAC, which is essentially aimed at working professionals. And I think in this context, this is also very relevant to remark, we have uh, uh, a number of participants that work in ministries of uh, science and technology, in ministries of industry. They work with government agencies or with private private sector agencies in charge of promoting um, industrial development as well as uh, science uh, and, and technological developments. And, uh, and so we have uh, uh, a foot in the uh, uh, training for research that is uh, rooted in, in uh, a PhD program. And, and I think that, you know, in addition to all these activities that have been um, uh, oriented to over, over a thousand uh, participants and students over the last decade, uh, all coming from many different countries, we've been having participants uh, from more than 99 countries over the last 10 years. Uh, one element that uh, you and you, Merit, has been contributing, and I think we'll, we'll be able to contribute in, in, in future collaborations, is the, the strong focus on research. The, the research that we do uh, ourselves, uh, professors and lecturers, as well as uh, uh, PhD students of different kinds, uh, uh, they produce research that is very relevant for 
the design, the, 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 the formulation, the implementation, the monitoring and evaluation of science and technology policies for sustainable development. Uh, this is very important. This is not only on what should be done, but is also on, on how, on the on the modalities, on the governance, on the on the on the how this policy should be uh, put in place. And just to give you a couple of examples, we have students, for example, working how the lithium industry is developing in Latin America and what appropriate policies should help uh, and nurture the development of this sector in Bolivia as well as in Argentina and Chile. We have uh, uh, another uh, area of research that has to do with coordination of different industrial and, and, and innovation policies with a special focus on, on Brazil. We have a number of students and colleagues working on uh, economic complexity and, and how economic complexity can be uh, promoted through uh, appropriate uh, um, uh, science and innovation policies. So, so we're trying to contribute to, to the research that is behind the, a lot of the training uh, oriented to capacity building for science, technology, innovation policies. And, uh, and I'm especially happy to, 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 uh, to be able to join this meeting because I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's a news of uh, a couple of days ago, but I've, I've also been appointed a UNESCO chair for uh, science, technology, innovation policies for sustainable development in Latin America, which which uh, gives me the opportunity to uh, try to link the work of you and you merit with the, with the work of UNESCO on these specific areas. So you have my availability and 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 uh, institutions. Uh, uh, willingness to support and contribute in all possible ways to the activities we are discussing today. And thank you again. <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you and congratulations again for that share. Uh, can I move on now to uh, Chuck? Uh, Chuck, can you please uh, give some sense? I mean, this proof has a long, long history around this uh, topic. So maybe what is uh, your take on, on this on these activities? Please, the floor is yours. Hello, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I have one slide. If it's okay to share it, just one yep. slide. As this guy says, so I'll try to do that quickly. Let's see. Yes, it's coming up. Okay, is it coming up? Uh, yes. Okay. In white screen, but I guess you will have animation. So please, please go ahead. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll be I'll be quick about that. So, so I'm Chuck. I'm based at the University of Sussex Science Policy Research Unit, where we've been involved in uh, innovation studies, but also innovation systems work for uh, for a while. Uh, there are many activities going on which are relevant to the SDGs and capacity building, but I'll just focus on one of them which is core. So it is uh, around the work we've been doing on a uh, transformative innovation policy with a strong focus on SDG and uh, SDG implementation, but also looking at working with various actors across the globe. The, the, this work is based on a, on a is based on the theoretical framework which we've been unpacking is still uh, still emerging on a uh, which we refer to as transformative change i won't go into details on it because of the time we have but uh, essentially is 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 to look at the three frames of innovation as the frame one being as uh, the push for science and economic growth and uh, and, uh, and and more, and more production and consumption different capabilities have been have been uh, developed for, for that but then the rationale, again, as many of us in this meeting already know, is to address market failure. It's important to provide this background a little bit. So the next uh, sentences will make a bit more sense. And then the NSI, which uh, SPRO has also been involved in quite a lot, but we know is important. Uh, we've, been, we've been working on that, but the focus here again has been on, uh, on uh, the key features have been strengthening the system, strengthening the actors, you know, innovation actors, but, uh, but they're, they're, but some work on the absorptive capacity. So, uh, so this too actually leads us to the to the work we're doing now around transformative change, innovation policy for transformation, or innovation policy for transformative change, which which builds on the SDG itself, which is uh, around transforming transforming our world. So, what are we trying to do? What is it responding to? Transformation failures around directionality, sustainability, promotion of sustainability, quite strongly inclusivity, but also we. We involve a lot of experimentation and learning. So, 
so that's the work. So in this, in, in the approach we're using, this is one way the SDG has been uh, unpacked into different ways. This is one of the way we're using it. This is not to say that's the only way or the best way. But the focus here is to focus on uh, is to look at systems change where we look at social technical systems, but also applications. So with the idea being that if we can, if we focus R&D and innovation on, 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 on systems change, system applying systems of innovation thinking, then we're able to achieve some of these other transversional directionality uh, concerns, which are poverty, growth, economic zero hunger. Within this framework as well, we have to, it's, there's a strong focus on, uh, on institutions and uh, on the framework conditions, which is policy, policy area. So how do we then, how do we re redo capacity? How do we rethink capacity with the systems view in mind, with the, with the systems change in mind? So that we're looking at uh, education systems, food systems, uh, water systems. Some of the work we've been doing now with South Africa, for example, has been looking at water systems and, uh, and in, in those areas. So. So the idea being, without changing the systems, it, won't, it may not be easy for us to achieve what we're looking at in the or the expectations that we want to achieve within the SDG. So, and then uh, uh, for the top, we see framework conditions, which which also emphasizes the role of partnerships, as the meeting of today showing many partners involved here. But then the role of partnership, the role of uh, the role of funding, the role of research. So. Quickly, lastly, as I'm getting to the end of my three, four minutes. So what do we recommend here? What are the recommendations? What is the implication for, for capacity strengthening for the SDG? So again, the idea here being to how do we develop capacities differently so that we actually focus on how to use capacity, how to use R&D capacity, innovation capacity to target transformation. So, so that's part of the work we've been doing across the world with, uh, with many partners, 12 partners. We've also been working with uh, the UN and working with uh, the EU in this area. And then emphasis on systems change, as I discussed, and then more of system innovation, not systems optimization per se, because I have some limitations, but there are more systems change. There's not much time to go into the details of that. We can go into that. And then it also calls for capacities to deal with transdisciplinary research. So uh, the research we've been involving in, we've been involving in not just multidisciplines or multidisciplinary actors, but also transdisciplinary issues, which is more action based research involving policy makers, involving grassroots actors, and they're also learning. So why is this important? Because if we actually want to know that the system is transforming, we're achieving the SDG, there's just, there's also a different way to measure that there. So we have to develop a different theory of change, but also transformative outcomes. We got what you call TOs here. Outcomes to help us know that the systems are transforming. We also need to be able to measure, uh, develop indicators and tools and some learning. And so collaborations have been many across uh, many countries, uh, as I mentioned, but also research. Uh, we've been involved in the guidebook development. There's been uh, involved in uh, with the UNCTAD and other colleagues on innovation policy learning, but also capacity and training. And so training in this case, again, to, uh, to target the SDGs, we're focusing on training that is not beyond individual capacity, but also organizational capacities a lot. Sure, uh, sure. Can I ask you to close? And systems <laughs> capacity. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, sorry to stop it. I think it's just taking a, a, within the order. I hope that was no more than five minutes. So I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Is that okay? It's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Quay. Uh, from a perspective of a uh, you know, public health center uh, in, in a developing country, uh, particularly Africa, can you sort of give some of your, your views on, on this issue that we're discussing, the partnerships and the capacity? Thank, thank you, you so much. And as a, a special thanks go to UNESCO for this opportunity. Uh, I have just one slide to speak to, but I would like to share the, the, my impressions about the U UN IATT capacity building. And I think that for me, being at the recipient end, I've had a lot of opportunity learning how the approaches to SCI policy making in the context of SDGs. I've also had a lot of opportunities coming, having to design instruments and also implement. And I want to emphasize on the use of the guidebook for the SD, SCI for SDG roadmap, which we actually use to develop the roadmap for Ghana. Um, also coming to application, we have had the opportunity to use the lessons that we have learned that the capacity built to review SCI policies, aligning SCI policies with developmental processes, and also having that huge reference material to always go back to. I would also want to touch on um, the fact that we have built capacity in uh, built, using the tools 
for consultative group and stakeholder engagement, particularly in SCI for SDGs, and also learning a little bit more of how to uh, develop advocacy around SCI for SDGs. I would also want to touch a bit on the capacity gaps. Moving forward, we think that there will be more um, uh, need to have SCI for SDG mainstreamed in developmental processes and also capture the success stories that we have on the ground for sharing purposes. Um, there is also need for SCI fiscal infrastructure to be built, but uh, looking ahead, I want to say that CSI Science and Technology Policy Research Institute has built the capacity and now we are in a position to also be given the opportunity to share among the sub region countries that is uh, within the sub region and also go moving beyond. We are looking forward for potential partnerships and collaboration in, in the case in the situation of SCI for SDG roadmap implementation and the emphasis is on implementation because we have had a lot of um, guidelines, we have a lot of policies and now we want to focus much very much on the implementation processes and build capacity in that area and also making sure that we flag a lot of social stories that will be able to tell the story much better than having um, uh, oral presentations. Um, again, the, the involvement of private sector and also invest, investment in emerging technologies because we realize that we are very far behind when it comes to adoption of emerging technologies. Built environment for SDI activities and also for research and also making sure that the digitalization processes that we have in Ghana going on actually reflect on available um, capacities for SDI for SDGs. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, the organizers. I'm very much appreciated. Thank you very much for, for this very insightful presentation in short time, but I think also reminding us some, some of the important uh, trends going around and shaping the need for, for this assessment. Uh, Professor Ogada, may I turn the, the, the floor for you uh, for your in intervention and sort of the comments on partnership with, with the IT? Yeah. Uh, th thanks very much. Uh, briefly, allow me to start uh, by saying that the African Center for Technology Studies is a science, technology and innovation think tank uh, established in uh, 1988 and mandated to strengthen uh, policies and uh, capacities of African countries and institutions to enable them harness science, technology and innovation for sustainable development. And we deliver this mandate through uh, STI policy research, uh, policy dialogue and engagement, and, and capacity building. And within the last 30 years, we have implemented quite a number of uh, uh, projects related to STI policy. And the last uh, uh, two years, we are implementing a project that I thought I should be able to uh, share with you as a way of articulating the gaps that I see uh, in terms of capacity building in the area of uh, STI. And the project, which is funded by the International Development Research Center of Canada, uh, is called Strengthening the, capac uh, the Capacity of Science Granting Council on the Use of Evidence for uh, STI Policy Making and Decision Making. And this is a project that we are implementing in uh, 15 African countries, targeting science gr granting councils, which also have mandate to develop uh, policies. And, and here then we are intervene, uh, intervening in four areas. Uh, the first is uh, the general STI policy formulation and review, uh, taking them through how to do it, the, the, the process, uh, stakeholders mapping and uh, engagement, and also highlighting some of the best practices. And through that, we have developed also tools and guidelines uh, to, to help uh, the, the, the councils in uh, developing and reviewing uh, their policy. The second one is uh, again uh, building capacity in the area of uh, data collection, collation and use uh, to provide really evidence to inform the policy making process, which really is uh, very key that uh, STI policy should actually be based on evidence and this evidence must be related to really issues that are important for the economic development of the specific uh, countries. Uh, the third area, which I think again is very, very important in terms of capacity building, 
is uh, developing STI policy implementation plan. And, and I'm glad my colleague from uh, Ghana mentioned this. Uh, in the past, as most of you would know, you'd have an STI policy uh, that also includes an implementation uh, structure within it. But we, also, uh, we all know uh, that uh, the STI policies are normally long term, 10 to 15 years, sometimes up to 20 years. And, and therefore you need to have a separate uh, STI uh, implementation plan. And this is something that we have found most uh, councils have actually embraced and, and therefore uh, an area that we are working with them to, to build their capacity on. And I think it is also an area that uh, might be very, very useful in terms of uh, collaboration and partnership. The fourth one, which is really the last one, is that as you are implementing, of course, you need to monitor, you need to evaluate, and that you need to draw uh, uh, learning and that best practices out of that. And then therefore, we are again uh, indicating that even as we uh, support uh, in terms of capacity building to develop implementation plan, we are also providing capacity building uh, in the area of monitoring, evaluation and learning. And more importantly then, how to systematically uh, collect data as you are implementing, uh, analyze them and, and use them to inform decision, particularly uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, revision, but even in terms of uh, res resource allocations and, and, and things like that. And the unique approach, which I thought I should be able to share, and that's the last uh, comment on this uh, moderator, uh, is the fact that we know we are dealing with 15 countries, but uh, uh, each of these countries have uh, their unique needs. They are at different level with respect to STI formulation, but even the review. And, and therefore, for each of them, we have uh, what we call uh, customized uh, plan, which we start by identifying uh, their needs in terms of capacities for uh, various aspects of uh, STI form, uh, uh, policy formulation and implementation. And based on that, then we are able then to give them what we call targeted and uh, individualized uh, formulated capacity building intervention. And uh, uh, we have noted there is enormous uh, demand. We are uh, not able to meet the various capacity building uh, requirements of uh, the, the council and therefore uh, provide their, a very, very good justification for partnership and collaboration with the various stakeholders uh, so that we can be able to build synergy and, and uh, support capacity building uh, in the area of STI uh, policy development and implementation. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, Professor Ogada. thank you very much for, for these comments uh, and thank you also uh, for Mr. Handan who's staying with us this late. I'm, we're running short of time, but uh, yeah, we will just close uh, take with the last two speakers and then we pass to the to the last closing of the, of the event. So please stay with us for a few more minutes. Uh, Mr. Handan, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, UNIATT, for the opportunity to intervene. International Science, Technology and Innovation Center for South-South Corporations under the auspices of UNESCO, or ISTIC, established in 2008, is a UNESCO Category 2 centre under the science policy domain. ISTIC's vision is to be a global leader in STI and the driving force for developing countries, nation building and socio-economic development. In the post-pandemic era, capacity building in the myriads of uh, STI sectors is an important driver for increased productivity and value addition to stimulate growth and competitiveness. In the context of the SDG framework, the implementation of the goals is replete with a number of challenges for which a close collaboration among stakeholders globally is indispensable. As a leading STI center under the uh, a species of UNESCO, it is imperative that it stick to establish a new flagship initiative called Global Innovative Research Consortium or GERC. GERC is a global collaborative platform to research, develop and strengthen local capability and capacity on emerging STI niche areas. 
GERD is based on the pentahelix collaboration model involving five main elements. That is the government, academia, industries, global partners and community. GERD is a global platform to research, develop and strengthen local capability and capacity on emerging STI niche areas to drive STI niche areas for economic growth and societal well-being, to support government implementation on shared prosperity towards achieving uh, SDGs. And also GERG is to promote science education, science and technology research culture, and knowledge-based economy. The establishment of GERG upholds the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development which uh, recognizes the STI as a key driver, enabling and accelerating the global transformation towards prosperity, uh, uh, inclusiveness and sustainability in develop, developing and developed countries. The establishment of GERC, uh, uh, Nano GERC, yeah, the first collaborative research to focus on six nanotechnology domains. They are renewables, therapeutics, development and delivery, electronics, devices and systems, food security, climate change and educational tools and robotics. GERC forms strategic partnerships with national, regional and international organizations that supports collaborative experimental research for global sustainability. The Alliance members shared a commitment to address the needs of global sustainability through the application of science and technology, researching towards a common objective sharing, uh, by sharing expertise, facilities and financial resources and transfer of technology. So uh, hopefully, ISTIC uh, will continue yeah, towards uh, striving and achieving its vision to be a global leader in science, technology, innovation and the driving force for developing countries, nation building and social economic development. So all members are invited to be part of the exciting journey of Nano GERC soon to be launched by ISTIC. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Madam Hamdan. Uh, thank you much for this uh, interesting initiative and hopefully more of this can be, you know, in, in all the parts of the world. So there is some critical mass of these uh, potential collaborations. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, David, David, uh, very nice to see you here with us. And let me just pass the floor uh, to you for some, uh, you know, comments from the, you know, from the IDRC. Thanks, Fernando. Um, Hello everyone, um, I'm Dave O'Brien and I work at the International Development Research Center. For those who do not know us, we're part of Canada's foreign affairs and development efforts and we champion and fund research and innovation within and alongside low middle income countries to drive global change. We invest in high quality research uh, in those countries, share knowledge with researchers and policymakers for greater uptake and use and mobilize our alliances to build a more sustainable, inclusive world. Um, I work in the education and science group, um, but more broadly, IDRC has a long history of supporting capacity and STI domains and in agencies through research, organizational strengthening and peer learning. Uh, Professor Ogata uh, discussed one of the initiatives that we are involved in on the Science Granting Council initiative. I will make a, a, a brief uh, comment on what I see as some emerging STI gaps uh, relating to a program that we are in the early stages of implementing called the Evidence for Innovation Program. The full title of which is Evidence for Innovation, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Impact Analysis for Innovation Support Programs in the SME Sector. Um, let me just make some connections here with some prior remarks from the panelists. Uh, we began with a, a plea from Professor Mahajran asking for the ITT to work uh, more closely with knowledge agencies in Africa. Um, Alessandro Bello talked about the great ex policy experimentation going on across the ACP region um, and interest in um, uh, learning from the, that experimentation. Uh, Fernando talked about the policy re mix requires monitoring and evaluation efforts on a continuous uh, basis to understand 
uh, what we're learning in the implementation process. Uh, and finally, just to, to pull another one, um, a question around what is the valuation of STI interventions? And it's with sort of those questions in mind that we built a, 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 a program that's trying to investigate um, the design and performance of STI implementation with a particular emphasis on in the low income countries. And, I, and that emphasis comes from a collaboration uh, with the United Nations Technology Bank and their mandate informed the geographic focus for this program. Let me just in talk briefly around some gaps we saw in the design of this program. And I think that it speaks to perhaps some more longer term issues, I think with the challenges that the SDG agenda will likely have. Um, I think the first gap, I, I'll just call the research gap. I think, you know, there are theoretical, methodological, empirical contributions that low income country based researchers can make to understand what contributes to undermines inclusive innovation. But at present, their collective contribution to knowledge generation is really lo quite low. Um, you know, writing over a decade ago, um, Joe Lorenzen stated that innovation studies have fundamentally neglected the poorer regions of the world. And there is only a nascent academic community dedicated to research on innovation in those countries. An update of that sort of a consensus, um, some authors writing in the journal Innovation Development concluded last year that at a time when thousands of innovation papers are published each year, only 57 publications from low income countries appeared in the web of science in 2019. This is the long tail of research. And I think that if you're looking at wanting to build capacity for STI strategy in those in those countries, we need to do something about it. And you know, IDRC is trying to play a role here in mobilizing it. They conclude their 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 review by saying research on innovation is not distributed in proportion to population lines, but mainly across income level lines. And when we looked closer at the authorship of publications and gray literature and evaluation studies in low income countries, the majority of authors were based in high income countries. So even when you speak of who is generating the evidence base on the on the innovation space, um, we have a concern here. I think part of the design of this program was motivated to increase that capacity. We move a little bit downstream in the use of that that data. I think the second gap I talk about would be the open data knowledge synthesis translation gap. We are seeing conscious efforts by research and policy communities to advance research and practice through expanding access to better innovation data, systematic reviews, impact studies and policy evaluations, resources such as the science and innovation policy evaluation repository, the innovation policy platform, registration databases for randomized control trials, systematic reviews are all emerging resources to understand what works and what doesn't in the STI space. But drawing on the first gap, there's few contributions from authors and in low income countries. And I think this is part of uh, a gap that we need to address. There was a discussion around the helixes, and one of those would be an academic government partnerships and dialogues policy forums for interrogating the evidence in the practice of innovation policy. And I think part of our consultations around this program when we were speaking with innovation agencies in low income countries, they talked there was a lack of collaboration with the academic sector. And I think maybe that in the design of the ITT programs, bringing those uh, consultations not with policymakers but with academic units might be um, uh, uh, something to explore and something that we are exploring. And I think finally the policy learning gap. Um, you would know better than this, um, but um, colleagues on the on the on the on the call. But when we consulted with a, a number of agencies. We were struck by the absence of any monitoring and evaluation units, performance units that are in within based embedded in these programs. There's a lot of emphasis on implementation and there can be lots of learning around implementation and that is important. But I was somewhat struck by the lack of any directed energy towards monitoring and evaluation within them. Um, uh, researchers at the bank, Sierra and Maloney talk about the innovation paradox. 
here around posit that the poorer the country, the greater the need for effective policy innovation. But it is in those countries that have the weakest capacity to analyze the business environment and to design and implement and evaluate the effectiveness of those policies. And so it's taking those gaps together that we're our contribution here is really trying to emphasize and build the capacity for research and analysis and linkages with the innovation policy community in low income settings. So thank you for your remark for the time. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. There's none of this uh, sort of all debates on the science policy interface and you know the ARC has a lot of you know communicating science to policy and I think it's an important reminder also the different actors involved. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm sorry that you know we have a, a short time and we already over time. I would just uh, like to pass the floor to my colleague Dimo, who is all part of the co convenience of this uh, group. Uh, Dimo, for you to give us some kind of sort of blessing before we all go and sure. thank you very much for staying with us until this late. Dimo, please. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, I think we're all blessed uh, in a way by the fantastic discussions and the extensive participation of a, of a largely diverse uh, number of participants and experts and panels and so forth. Uh, it's very rare to, to be at such a dense, concentrated event with so many facets exposed and s such fantastic and, and, and valuable contributions. Uh, spanning all the way from the policy side to, to uh, all sorts of discussions on how STI, what it means for, for entrepreneurship and the various linkages and so forth, uh, uh, and as well as on the academic side and, and the need for, for more research that is really relevant for a developing uh, a country and a development context, but also looking at the SDGs as well. Uh, as as uh, David lastly pointed out, uh, we tend to have biases depending on where research funding is, is coming from. So we tend to look at things depending on who's paying and, and, and when, where the funding is coming from. And that, that uh, tends to inform our, our perception in a slightly biased way as well. So a couple of takeaways uh, for, 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 from what I have from the discussion. Uh, we see that we need an increasing need for, for increasing uh, capacities as the development discourse on STI is being more technical, not only in technology perspective, but also from a perspective of, of development economics and overall social development policies. That's a, a very important thing. Um, this is really important for unlocking potential. So we need to have this increased uh, uh, capacity in policy making policy implementation, policy design, monitoring evaluation, so following through the whole policy cycle in order to unleash the potential, the innovation potential in the development context. What this really means is unleash the innovation potential of entrepreneurs, firms and, and industries, as well as uh, uh, social innovators, uh, innovation that, that has to do with uh, uh, various societal and SDG challenges as well. Uh, and this leads us to, to highlight somewhat, perhaps in our future work, a bit more strongly the relationship between STI and entrepreneurship and what are all the facets that we need to put in there and some of them maybe we have, we have missed or need to, to underscore. Uh, I think that in the discussion, uh, in particular in the, in, the, in, the, in the second and third segment, really underscore the, 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 the nature and the need for, for collaboration, which itself is underscored by uh, 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 diverse perspectives and 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 certain complementarities, or, or rather, uh, ensured complementarities among all of us here, and that we all have a huge benefit in, in in collaborating on the various policy issues that relate to capacity building for STI. Uh, we have been reminded that. Uh, uh, we are all not working for, to do research for research sake, sake or policy design in order to have nice pretty policies published, but we, we need to have a transformational impact of what we do. And that means that innovation has to look towards or serve the sustainable development goals and broader uh, social and economic development uh, aspirations of developing and least developed uh, countries. Uh, necessarily an open approach uh, to delivering the training, including the training itself, but also the training materials and so forth is a, is a welcome facet. And we need to also try to focus a bit more on tools for stakeholder engagement. We have had very good stakeholder engagement. We're always uh, somewhat positively surprised and pleased at the uh, participants at our various events and sessions, including this one. I think I, I tallied, we had 109 participants at, uh, at one point. And, uh, and stakeholder engagement is increasingly and, and very important in our work because uh, it is one thing to talk to, to, to among us ourselves, among people who have 
some kind of uh, uh, academic or policy expertise, but when we reach out to, to people on the ground and in various uh, agencies, institutions, and broader beneficiaries of STI processes, that adds another quality, another dimension to our work. Uh, in this sense, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to close now the session, uh, give a great big thanks to, to, to of course, our, our fantastic panelists, to our participants for, for, for putting forward a lot of questions. Uh, I can ensure you from, from our perspective of all the IATT Workstream 6 uh, members and, and various agency uh, representatives that we are uh, continue to be open. We, we, we encourage collaboration. Please get in touch with us to, to continue this dialogue and we hope to see all of you and all your uh, 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 collaborators, colleagues, peers and so forth at our future events, including of this kind, but more importantly, during the during the training capacity building events that we hold in the near future. So thank you very much once again. Uh, more information is of course uh, available at our, at our website. And once again, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us should you have any questions or queries about collaborating or future work. So thanks very much. Thanks to everyone. A big handshake to everyone and a big bravo. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, before we close, if you can spare uh, 10 more seconds or 15 seconds, uh, please can you turn on your cameras? And we would like to have a family photo for those of you who are still brave enough to, 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 to stay with us for a, just a few more seconds, please. <clears throat> and say, May, you, I will, you will signal when I can uh, set everybody free. I know that people are busy and some, 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 this is late, but uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, the information is uh, again on the website, uh, the links to the materials and it's all available there or should be coming available in the next uh, few days, including some of the, I mean, I guess some summary of this meeting, but uh, please, as Dimo said, uh, please stay in touch with us if you have any question, any issue that we can address. So, um, yeah, without uh, further ado, can, is, is this ready, Sernay? Uh, already okay <clears throat> so you big smile and well thank you very much have a nice uh, rest of the day uh, and looking forward to meet you in the next event thank you bye bye